Dr. Hum, Dr. Hung and Dr. Salberman, thank you so much. I'd now like to bring up Dr. Ehrlich to present. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It was nice to come back to New York for the first time in a while. Um, so uh, I wish I could give an easy answer to the question that Simon uh, proposed for me, but uh, I'll do my best to talk through a little bit of my thought process uh, of sort of how we get to the right therapy. And I have a few um, disclosures. So there are a lot of options, as you learned uh, just a few minutes ago, about, for treatments of your IBD. And medications are the big one, and that's what I'm going to focus on today, but also recognize there's conversations about using nutrition and diet. There's complementary and alternative therapies, and there's surgery as well. And so we're going to touch on some of these things over the course of the day, um, but I'm going to speak uh, mostly on medication options. And so what are the goals? And so um, uh, Dr. Sauberman and Hung uh, mentioned a little bit of this. And it's important to understand, though, that the goals that we have may be a little bit different than the goals that you have. And knowing that up front, it may help figure out sort of why we want to do the things we want to do. Um, so we want clinical remission, right? We want you to feel good. We want you to not have any symptoms. And you may hear us talk about certain scoring systems that we use in the clinical realm to think about, you know, well, you know, how much diarrhea and how much blood. And so there's a Mayo score, which people use a lot for ulcerative colitis. The Harvey Bradshaw Index is another one you may hear in Crohn's disease. And then we also talk about uh, endoscopic remission, as was just uh, mentioned in the last talk. And so the concept here, and uh, if you guys can see, on, all the way on the right is a picture of uh, severe ulcerative colitis. And all the way on the left is pretty normal uh, colonic mucosa. And so when we see the stuff on the right, we don't like that. And we want to move uh, your disease towards the left so things look less and less inflamed. And why does that matter? That was um, uh, mentioned a little bit previously, is that we know that people who have a lot of inflammation inside, even if they're feeling fairly well, are at risk for disease flare in the future, are at risk for uh, uh, higher rates of colon cancer, are at risk for complications of their Crohn's disease. And so when we talk to you about, hey, well, we want to check and see if the medicine's working, we want to monitor your fecal calprotectin, we want to do that another colonoscopy, Oftentimes, the reason is we want to make sure that we've achieved some of this endoscopic remission in addition to the clinical remission, which we'll ask you about. Now, given all of that, patients care about this stuff, right? They want to be able to go to their dance and have a relationship and have kids and go to the soccer games and, and, uh, and all of that. And so I think it's important to make these goals clear. You know, I talk about, oh, let's do this scope and we got to increase this amount of inflammation or whatever, and all you guys want to do is get to work and, and see your kids. And um, keeping that in perspective is really important because sometimes we don't know exactly what's important to you if you don't tell us uh, or if we don't ask, right? And, and thinking about what medicine might work for you, and we'll talk in a minute about, you know, how we give the medicines. Well, an IV medicine might not work for someone who's traveling all the time for their, for their work. Um, so we just got to keep those things in mind. So uh, I had a great uh, uh, intro already on what the available medications are already. I'll, I'll add a few extras. So for ulcerative colitis, um, in addition to everything that Simon mentioned, we also have mesalamine, 5-ASA products, um, the oral pills and uh, um, rectal uh, suppositories and enemas that have been available forever and are great for early uh, or sort of mi more mild therapies. We have steroids and we have immunomodulators. And those are the additional ones than what uh, were previously mentioned. For Crohn's disease, you know, there's this question of whether 5-ASA uh, or mesalamine products are helpful. Um, we sort of generally think not in most circumstances. And all those other uh, medications. Okay, so what do we know about efficacy? And the answer is not a whole lot, to be honest with you. We know that all the medications are better than placebo. That's what got them approved by the FDA. But there's only one drug trial in ulcerative colitis that really compared two therapies to one another. So it was adalimumab, Humira, versus vedalizumab, Intivio, in patients that had never been on any of these therapies before. And the conclusions was that Intivio worked a little bit better. And there's a lot of 
details, but that's a very simplistic version. And there's one trial in Crohn's disease called Seaview where they compared standard Humira to standard Stellara, Ustekinumab, in patients that had never been on these medicines. And there was, didn't seem to be any difference between those two drugs. Again, some details to, to that I'm overlooking. But, um, but that's really all we know. Uh, so when we're comparing, well, should we put you on Remicade versus Zaposia versus whatever, we've never compared these drugs to each other. Um, and uh, hopefully, as time goes on, we'll learn a little bit more. Um, and the problem is, as was alluded to, these are really expensive drug trials to run. And so companies who run, who, who pay for all of this stuff are not overly enthusiastic about doing some of these trials on the fear that it doesn't work out for their particular drug and they've you know, spent millions of dollars on something. We have a lot of observational data. So once the drugs get into the market and we're using them, we can look back at patients who, hey, these group of patients that was on Intivio for a while and this group of patients that was on Remicade for a while, um, you know, how well are they doing in the future? But they really were not designed to compare the two things. And so we're sort of making some judgments and assessments that may not really hold up in real life, but it's sort of the best we have. But as I said, no other direct comparisons. So how do we pick, right? It would be great if I could tell you, oh, this drug works the best, and then this drug, and then this drug, and that's the order we're going to go in. So what are some of the factors? Number one, what's your prior IBD history, right? Are you someone who is just recently diagnosed, and we're talking about the first medication we're going we're gonna to uh, give to you? Or are you someone who's been on seven different things and has had three surgeries and had all these other complications, or are you somewhere in the middle? Assessment of your IBD severity, right? Do you have mild disease? Do you have severe disease? What are the factors about you that make us think your disease might be more severe in the future? And again, I wish we had a great tool to say, oh, patient X is going to have a sort of mild course and patient Y is going to have a real severe course. But we don't. So we have some general factors. People that are diagnosed young tend to have more severe disease over the course of their lifetimes. Um, people who have surgery, who require surgery early on, tend to have more severe disease, who have deep ulceration on endoscopy. And so these are some of the things that we can use as sort of guides, but it's not 100%. What is efficacy? So if we're thinking about using Stellara versus Humira, or if we're thinking about using Intivio versus uh, uh, Humira, okay, we have those two uh, studies, but we don't have a lot of great other stuff. We're going to talk about safety. We're going to talk about mode of administration, concomitant medical problems, extraintestinal manifestations, and insurance access. All right, so efficacy we spoke about already. Limited direct head-to-head -head data. And there's increasing observational data, but it may not be right for you, right? So just because we, you know, we looked at two cohorts of patients that were compared between the Remicade and Intivio, you know, maybe you're not the person that fit into that trial. Maybe you're older than the group of patients that was examined. Maybe you are, you know, you're not a smoker and they looked at smokers, or, you know, or whatever the case may be. Um, you may not fit, but here's some general guidance. No medicine works for everyone. Right? So even in the best trials and in the best data, we're looking at 67, you know, two-thirds percent efficacy, maybe 75 percent, uh, you know, three-quarters of people efficacy, but not 100 percent. And again, I wish I could tell you, oh, this drug is definitely going to work for you versus not, but we don't have that. No medication works immediately. Some may be faster than others, but if I put you on one of these therapies today, we might have to wait few weeks or even a few months sometimes, depending on the therapy, um, to really get a sense of whether it works. There's a general feeling that the first advanced therapy we choose, biologic or, or, um, or JAK inhibitor, may be the most effective. Um, although with some of the newer uh, drugs, that may not be quite as, as true as, as it used to be. And so we really want to pick you sort of do our best shot the first time to get, to get things right, understanding the limitations. And in the real world, patients don't fit the strict criteria of clinical trials, right? They are not monitored 
every two weeks. They don't have diaries that they are filling out all the time. You know, they may have had a history of cancer when cancer patients were excluded from the trials. They may, um, you know, are on concomitant, uh, you know, other medical therapies or on, uh, have other medical problems that uh, excluded them, that would have excluded them from the clinical trial, and so maybe the tr clinical trial data doesn't really fit for them. All right, so thinking about safety. So in general, and again, you know, uh, um, with some of these assumptions, we think that the benefits of these medicines outweigh the risks. You can get infusion reactions or injection site reactions if these are medications that are given in those forms. You can have an allergy to, uh, to one of these medicines if you've never been on it before. And understanding what you've been on previously can be helpful here, right? If you've had a bad reaction to a medicine in a particular drug class, maybe choosing another medicine in that drug class may not make, may make the most sense if we have other options available. And as was already discussed, all these medicines work by suppressing the immune system because as the, the inflammation is driven by immune system sort of overdrive. And by doing that, we increase risks of infection. And we can increase, in certain circumstances, risks of malignancy of cancer. There are some cardiac risks to think about. Um, and again, I'm not sort of going to go through every single medication here, but some of the meds uh, seem to have uh, some increased cardiac risks. Um, but keeping in mind that the risks of these medicines need to be balanced with the risks of not being on the medicines, right? And a lot of times um, I'll have patients say, well, I, I'm not crazy about, you know, X, Y, or Z risk. And I say, I understand that. But if you don't go on one of these medicines, besides the fact that you may continue to feel bad, you, you may require surgery, you may have get an infection, um, and things of that sort. So we always have to keep in mind the, the alternative hypothesis, right? If we don't do something, what may happen? And then there are some special populations to be considered as well, right? So if, if you're a young woman that may be thinking about pregnancy um, or breastfeeding, are there medicines that work or that, or that we should be avoided uh, in that circumstance? And I'll say just as a sort of a blanket statement, in general, we think these medicines are safe in pregnancy and, um, and breastfeeding. However, the newer medicines, we don't have a lot of data on them yet. And so um, we'll be a little bit cautious in some of the new ones that... Um, that Simon mentioned, uh, at least until we get a little bit more data and feel more comfortable that they may be safe. Um, in patients that are elderly or patients that are immunocompromised, we may be thinking about increasing those risks of infection or of cancer, um, may sort of sway the balance choosing one medication versus another. How do we give these medicines? You guys know some of this already, right? So patients have different opinions on what works for them, and sometimes I'm surprised when I talk to patients about things that I might think would be a better scenario, they don't necessarily think is the best scenario for them. Um, so you can give medicines uh, intravenously, often every eight weeks, although sometimes that can be changed. You'll get loading doses at the beginning, so Remicade is a, and, and Intivio are the examples. You'll give the first three doses over the first eight weeks, and then it's in every eight weeks after that. And a new complication in this process is where you actually get your infusion, right? So you get it at a hospital-based infusion center. A lot of insurance companies are not allowing us to do that anymore. You get it at an outpatient infusion center, and you have home infusion. You know, a nurse comes to your house and helps. And, I, and I'll tell a quick uh, anecdote, and I have a good friend on Remicade for Crohn's, and I always sort of thought, hey, home infusion sounds great, right? You know, someone comes to the house. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. And she's like, it's terrible. I have to clean. I have to feel like my house has to get clean before the nurse comes. I have to coordinate, you know, getting the shipment ahead of time beforehand and all that stuff. So it's not quite as, as straightforward as just someone shows up and does it, right? Um, and then the infusion is three hours. And then what do you talk to the, the nurse about for three hours? I can't do my other thing. So... Um, so you can, you can do self-injections. A lot of these medicines are injections. Depending on the medicine, they can be every two, four, or eight weeks. And again, you'll have some loading doses early on. Um, we have oral medications. Um, and, uh, and so thinking about um, you know, sort of what works for a patient's lifestyle is important and may affect what we choose, right? So you know, I, have a, I just saw a patient this week, a college student at Temple. He lives in Boston. And so what does he do if he gets an infusion over the course of the summer when he goes home, you know, you know, or if he's going to travel for a study abroad, doing an infusion may not make the most sense if we're picking a medicine for the first time. Um, what are other medical problems that might affect things? So 
you know, there are conditions that you may have that would exclude certain medications. So, for example, the TNF medications are contraindicated in heart failure because heart failure patients, uh, the TNFs can make things worse. Um, some of the newer, um, the JAK inhibitors can increase the risk of blood clots. So if you have a history of blood clots, that may not be the right choice for you. Alternatively, there are, medic there are medical problems you could have that might favor using a certain medication. So a lot of the rheumatologic diseases, these drugs are approved for them as well. And so if you have psoriasis, Stelara is approved for psoriasis, Stelara is approved for Crohn's disease. So it might make sense. You can sort of treat two things at the same time. If a patient is on other medications or have other medical problems uh, uh, that makes them have an immunocompromised or immunosuppressed state, we may want to think about that. And then there are medical conditions that may limit the way we can give drugs. So I have patients that have needle phobias. They do not want to give themselves injections, even though you can barely see the needle in some of these, uh, in some of these things. There are patients that are IV drug users that can't get IVs. It's impossible to get an IV. And so, you know, giving them an IV, um, an IV medication causes a lot of frustration. Folks that have vision problems may not be able to handle, you know, some of the injections and other things. So there's, there's a, you got to take a little bit of a holistic approach in thinking about what medicine to use. Some extra intestinal manifestations. So extra intestinal manifestations of your IBD, perianal Crohn's disease, ankylosing spondylitis and other rheumatologic um, problems, pyoderma, which is a skin manifestation, uveitis is an eye manifestation, they all um, can theoretically be treated by some of these medications. Um, and so if you have a history of these, you may want to think about one medicine versus another. And then lastly, um, insurance. And um, an unfortunate reality of our healthcare system um, and I, I know the effect that it has on patients, and it has a lot of effects on our abilities to do what we want to do. So the, real, the, the realistic view is this is often the largest reason we pick up certain medicine. What's, what can we get a patient on their insurance policy? Um, and that's not the best way to do it, but it's sometimes the way we have to. Um, most insurers have preferred medications and formulary medications, and to get medicines outside of that group can be very challenging, particularly for patients that haven't been on anything yet. In some ways, people that have failed a bunch of stuff, this gets a little bit easier because we can make arguments saying, hey, you failed all these things, we gotta give this medicine. Whereas if we have all these options and they haven't failed anything, um, they may uh, push us to choose uh, a particular medicine. This often requires extra appeals and extra reviews. Um, both for choosing a medicine and also when we sometimes want to give something uh, at an off-label dosing. So um, some of you may have, you know, had to change your dose of, say, Humira, for example, from every two weeks to every week. FDA does not approve that dose, and so getting that approval may take, um, may take extra time. It absolutely creates additional hassles, additional paperwork and treatment delays, and many patients, some of you probably here in the room, have had problems with their IBD because we haven't been able to get medicine X or Y approved or changed uh, uh, in time. Um, and then even with an approval, depending on the insurance policy, there may be a significant costs. Um, and, you know, they'll say, okay, well, you can get it, but you have to pay a 30% coinsurance on a drug that costs $50,000 a year, and that's not feasible uh, for a lot of folks. So um, there are some patient assistance programs available, particularly for the newer therapies um, that the pharma companies have available, but they are limited to commercial insurance. Uh, and so in my patient population, I have a lot of patients that are on government health ins uh, insurance, um, Medicaid and, and such, and uh, they don't qualify. So the patients that are in some ways the, the most vulnerable are the ones that don't have access uh, to, the, to the medications. And I'll put in a plug for the foundation uh, that does a lot of advocacy, uh, both on the state and federal level, trying to push legislation that will streamline this process. There are a number of bills, both uh, in state governments and uh, nationally, that are trying to make this process easier, at least a little bit more transparent, at least with some more um, uh, speed, so you know we're not waiting weeks or months for decisions about medications, and we can get answers within a few days. And so um, I'm sure the foundation folks will be happy to talk to you guys uh, if you're interested in you know talking to your um, to your Congress people. 
Um, and so I'll summarize uh, and then happy to take questions. So being clear about the goals of treatment are important uh, for expectation setting. Um, we have limited comparative efficacy data between therapies, so I wish I could tell you, hey, drug X is going to work better than drug Y, but we don't necessarily know that. There are a lot of factors to think about in picking what therapy is right for you, and we went through some of them, the efficacy of the drug, safety, mode of administration, extraintestinal manifestations, concomitant medical problems, and insurance access. Uh, but decisions about therapy should be personalized because it's, there is no one-size-fits-all uh, for everybody here, right? It's not everyone be on drug X first. Um, and we have to take all of these things into account. Um, and the best therapy is one that works, one that you can access, and one that you feel comfortable with. And so have that conversation with your doctor about what, what are the important things for you and and push your doctor to explain why they're recommending drug X versus drug Y. And I hear so many times patients that come to see us where their original gastroenterologist said, oh, you should be on this medicine. And that's it. And, and you know, you, you need to understand why and you need to probe a little bit into thinking about, you know, what are the, what are the factors that, that work for you in the, in the realm of some of the things that we spoke about. So 